Welcome to the Music Ed Matters podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Emily williams Birch, and this podcast, it exists for you. Whether you're a music lover, an educator, a choir member, each week we bring guests to the show to help explore what matters in music. I'm so glad that you're here. Welcome to the show. Hello, and welcome to episode 80 of the Music Ed Matters podcast. Today, we have a very special teacher spotlight. These episodes highlight teachers out in the trenches doing their thing. And today, we talk to Miss Sandy Thornton. Sandy works as the Assistant Associate Artistic Director at the Cincinnati Youth Chorus, and she is the Director of Traditional Music at a church, and she is serving as an interim music teacher or choir conductor at a junior high and high school in town. So we talk today about what led you to choir, why do you love it, and what are the connections between all three of these very different spaces, and as listeners, you're going to walk away with some ideas. I call it the Sandy Thornton approach. You'll have to listen to get it, but you're definitely going to find some fun little nuggets that you can use in your space immediately. Thank you so much for listening. If you want more, go over to patreon.com slash music ed matters and you can join the community over there. We meet up once a month. You get bonus episodes and y'all the December bonus episode is Spencer and I, my husband and I. So uh, you're in for a treat on that bonus episode. Anyway, there's bonus episodes, bonus content and the monthly meetups over there at Patreon. If you don't have time for Patreon, that's okay, but we do need likes and reviews so we can get our episodes out to a wider audience. So if you can take a couple seconds and just let people know what you think. Click the like button, write a little review. Should be done in under 60 seconds. I appreciate you so much for listening. As always, this episode is brought to you by our friends over at the Kinnison Choral Company. I think that's all the announcements for now. So without further ado, a teacher spotlight with Miss Sandy Thornton. Today on the Music Ed Matters podcast, we have a very special teacher spotlight with my friend, Sandy Thornton. Hi, Sandy. Hi, Emmy. How are you? I'm so excited to finally be talking to you about life as a teacher. What are you up to? Tell the listener, who is Sandy Thornton? Hi, everybody. Thank you. First of all, Emmy, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here and spend this time with you and all of your listeners. Uh, So my name is Sandy Thornton, and um, I live in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I currently um, have a lot of irons in the fire. I um, am the Assistant Artistic Director of the Cincinnati Youth Choir. I work at uh, a Methodist church uh, in town here. I'm the, um, excuse me, Director of Traditional Music, and I just signed on to do a um, leave replacement at one of the local high schools and junior highs here in my city. Um, So there's just a lot going on. My history is in education. I taught for a number of years at all different types of levels from elementary up to collegiate. And um, so it's good to be back in the classroom. I'm really excited. When you posted on social media that you were taking this high school gig, I was like, yes, what a perfect conversation. Because I'm always wondering, as someone who I just sing at church for fun, What are the connections? What are the tie-ins between life as a music educator and life as a church musician? So we'll talk about that today and we'll tie it into your work with community choirs. But tell us a little bit, how did you get into choir life? What, What drew you to the profession of music? Oh, thank you for asking. That's a great question. Um, So probably like so many of your listeners, I have been singing since childhood. And I actually got my start uh, singing. I'm from New York originally. I'm from Syracuse. And I started singing in the Syracuse Children's Chorus. Shout out Dr. Tag, episodes 1 and 50. Woo! (laughs) Under the direction of Dr. Barbara Marble Tag. And um, I just fell in love with choir. I think that she cultivated such a beautiful environment of acceptance and high level artistry, I thought like, why would I ever stop doing this? And so that was kind of the start. And I got through my high school experience and um, pursued a degree in music education from the Crane School of Music at SUNY Potsdam. And then uh, went and got my master's here in Cincinnati at the College Conservatory of Music at UC. And um, just, I jumped in. Um, and, And that's pretty much my story. I taught for a year in Texas. I taught for a year in Louisiana and then I got married and came back to Cincinnati and I've been here ever since working for the Cincinnati Youth Choir. Um, And I think that was the other thing is that, um, you know, when I was a student in my master's degree, Rob and Lana of the Cincinnati Youth Choir took me aboard as her student intern and then her assistant. And I just, I don't know, I fell in love with the art of making music with young people. 
Ooh, I like how you call it the art of making music with young people. I think that's going to have to be the episode title, the art of making music with young people. That's perfect. Tell us a little bit more. Let's unpack that. What do you mean by the art of making music? Um, Well, I think that before I had any experience working with kids myself, I just thought that singing, making music with kids was just, you know, a fun thing. And then I actually started doing, I was able to view it from a different lens as opposed to the performer. I was now the educator and um, I have been continuously over the last, what, uh, multiple, multiple years blown away by what children are capable of doing. Um, You know, I think a lot of times, and I say this to my own choirs that, you know, when we see a group of young people, you know, little little babies, little kiddos uh, standing on risers, most people think, oh, that's so cute. But they're so much more than just cute. I mean, they're Mm -hmm. cute. But the fact that they can take a piece of music and internalize it and then go ahead and share it Artistic, artistically and beautifully and emotionally with an audience. I just, I don't know. I just feel like there's no end to what children are capable of doing. And I love exploring that with them. I think that's beautiful. How do you explore it? Let's talk about some of the sequences and some of the fun things that you're doing. Let's focus on the Cincinnati Youth Choir side. So okay. how do you help your young people internalize the music? Right. So For my groups, I have a choir that spans the ages of third to all the way through eighth grade. Um, I have two two ensembles within the body of the program. Um, So I have a third to fifth grade choir, and then I have a fifth to eighth grade choir. So upper elementary, middle school. And for so many of those kids, the first experience they get singing in a choir is walking through my door and walking into my rehearsal for the first time. So we do a lot of game play to be honest with you. And I think one of the highest compliments I was ever given was by a parent. She said, um, you know, my kid is learning, but they don't even realize they're learning because it's so fun, because it's Mm -hmm. so play-based. And so a lot of times for, you know, the basic concepts that we as adult musicians don't even think about, again, they're hearing for the first time. And so, you know, there's something to be said for if you say something to somebody, they may not remember. But if you make them do something physical or a game or something, they are more likely to remember whatever concept it is you're trying to teach them. So we play a lot of games. Um, We do lots of singbacks. And again, most of these kids, maybe this is their first, you know, foray into group singing. Um, They may have sung in their car or their bedroom, but (laughs) to have to sing with other people, it's just kind of a different thing. And so we talk a lot about you know, what is it like when we sing with our friends? You know, what types of things do we have to listen for? What types of things do we have to be sensitive about, you know, as artists, as musicians? And I always say that they're artists. They're, you know, they're young musicians. But You call them artists. Truly, because they are. They are. And in this development that they're having, in this journey, this education, you know, the goal is not necessarily to create future music education majors. It The goal truly is to create future lovers and consumers of music and future artists, you know, but they, we all have to start somewhere, right? I love it. Okay, walk us through like a game or two. You have your, you have your third through fifth graders and what's the song? What's the concept? What's the game? Okay, so one of my favorite games is, and I usually do this right at the start of the year. Um, and this is basically when we're learning all of the concepts. So crescendo, decrescendo, staccato, legato, forte, piano, like all of those types of things we are introducing. So one of my favorite games to play is I have, and I wish I had brought them today, but I have these little foam hearts. It's like foam paper. Okay. And I cut little hearts into them. And on the front of the heart, it has a musical concept. So say crescendo. Right. And on the back, uh, it has the definition of what a crescendo is to gradually get louder. And so as the students, as the singers walk in, what I like to do is actually hand each of them a heart and say, hold on to this close to your heart, your own heart. Don't let anybody see it. Go find your seat. Okay, so that's how they enter my room. And then um, once all of the singers are in their respective seats with their hearts against their own heart, we talk about the different concepts of music. We go over that. And hopefully at this point, this wouldn't be something I'd do on day one, but maybe day three, you know, where we've had a chance to get to know one another, build relationship, 
build rapport, and then um, also hopefully touch upon these different concepts. So we would go over them as an ensemble. And so it would be just, a, you know, a very quick, all right, talk to me about a crescendo. Who can tell me what a crescendo is, you know? Um, or what does it mean to gradually get softer? Who knows the fancy Italian word for that? And so we go over it like that. And then the game progresses. Um, we talk about that each of them have their heart, that they are to look at their heart, see what their word is, see what their concept means. But again, don't let anybody see it. And then we all stand up. And this is obviously very pre-COVID, okay? <laughs> so this is in the before times when we could actually like hold hands with one another. <laughs> yes, it'll be back. So yeah, it will be. But um, so then the idea is that they spread out in my classroom or my rehearsal room and we have a musical sentence. And my musical sentence, for whatever reason, is always... Um, it's usually singing in choir is awesome because it is right. Mm -hmm. And so we speak that sentence using the various words on all of their little hearts. So if it's a crescendo, singing in choir is awesome. If it's staccato, <laughs> singing in choir is awesome or something along that fact. Okay. And so once we establish what that is, they have to walk around to the various people, their, their colleagues with their hearts and speak the sentence in the way that is on their heart. And if they come across somebody that has the same heart, the same staccato, the same legato or crescendo, um, they find their person and they have to link arms together. And then they start walking around as a little amoeba, amoeba together. Oh, that's right? so cute. And so if they come across somebody that is not the same term, the same musical concept, they just say, thank you, goodbye. And they walk away. And so basically what we're doing is we're creating groups within the body of the rehearsal you have your crescendo group, you have your decrescendo group, you have your staccato group, your legato. And then we just kind of go around and each of them perform their sentence as a small ensemble in the way that is on their heart. Oh it's my kind gosh. of a nice icebreaker. That sounds like so much fun. I feel like some of my college kids would enjoy that activity. I enjoy that activity. <laughs> sounds like so much fun. What? A, and then do you proceed to then use those hearts throughout the semester or do you bring them up or... Yeah, they come back, they make lots of different appearances because again, this is how we introduce these concepts. Um, and then we go ahead and try to find the different concepts in the music that we are doing. So a lot of our education is through the choral music that we're working on within the mm -hmm. body of the semester. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love this. Okay, so the heart, Sandy Thornton's heart game is gonna to make an appearance around the country. I hope to hear all about it. I wanna see pictures. It's so fun. Okay, so, give us something that you would do with your older kids. So you have the fifth through eighth grade group. Would they be able to, would they like this game? Do they like you this know, game? You know, yeah, I have done this with students of all ages. Mm -hmm. um, I would definitely do this with my middle school, school group as well. Um, you know, and the great thing is that, you know, in Cincinnati Youth Choir, my choirs are between 30 and 40, okay, ideally, right? Mm -hmm. So would I do this in a middle school setting with a choir of 90? It might be a little chaotic. So I think size has a little bit to do with it, but I would absolutely do it with the middle school kids. Um, and I, you know, it might be a situation where it's a good way to break them into groups instead of saying A, B, or one, two, three, four. Mm -hmm. It's a nice student directed way of getting them into smaller ensembles for various group work on small ensemble work. Um, we can do it for things like sight singing games, rhythm games, you know, mm -hmm. and that way they can be in teams. I love that. I know that in college, I had a professor that did a similar activity with index cards. We all came in with a series of index cards and we had five or six vocabulary words that we had with Shankarian analysis. So vocabulary and Shanker was like, woo. So we had to define it. And then we had to get in our group and make sure that we like whatever our word was, that we were happy with how we defined it. And then each of us had that word on an index card and had to go pair up and switch off with other people in the room until you had taught everybody else every other word on the list smart yeah that's a great it's a great way for student directed teaching as well mm -hmm. I again, love that. yeah if if the kids can teach it to the other kids mm -hmm. they have the concept themselves and think right? of all the differentiation like with your third to fifth grade group it's ground zero but maybe for right. your middle school group this you have you. student leaders and they're catching everyone else up how much fun okay so we have game-based learning in your community choir how do some of those skills transfer to to you can choose your own ending. Do you want to connect how they transfer to your church setting or to your current interim position at the middle school or junior high and high school? Let's start with the interim position. Just okay. Because, you know, age wise, it's more. So you have a junior high and a high school that you are in your interim while the person is out on medical leave and you're subbing. 
What's that look like? How are you building rapport really fast? Um, well, it starts on day one. You know, a lot of what I do, uh, you're building relationship. And and I, we've point blank, I'm a cook in somebody else's kitchen in yes. this capacity, right? So it's kind of like being the crazy aunt that gets to go in and rile everybody up and then send them back to their parents. Um, so I have to, because my time is limited with them and we still have things that we've got to accomplish, um, they have performances coming up. Um, I have to very quickly show them who I am as a person and and kind of see who they are as people. Um, so a lot of what I do is truly just like, it's non-musical. I stand at the door and greet every single student as they come in and say, hi, how are you? We take time at the beginning of class to, I think that one day I said, tell me one thing that either you want me to know about you or that you've done this week that you are proud of. So again, building relationship because they're not going to sing comfortably for me if they don't trust me mm. and they don't trust who I am as a person. Like I could be the best music teacher in the world, but if they don't trust me, it doesn't matter because- okay anything I say is not going to stick. Mm -hmm. So um, you're taking time to build those relationships through conversations. Are you using some of your games from your Cincinnati Youth Choir stuff? Yeah. Um, so to be fair with you, I haven't done a whole lot of DJing. I'm just starting this position um, at this uh, school system. Um, but the goal is, yeah, that I can do you know, some of the games that I do with CYC, you know, and it might not be the heart game, but maybe it's Poison Rhythm, the Poison Rhythm game. Do you know that one? How's the Poison Rhythm? I, I think I know it, but I'd love to hear you explain it. Yeah. Um, so we write a rhythm on the board. It's usually a uh, four, four time, one singular measure for the middle school. I might do two measures for the high school kids. Um, and I either clap it or do it on counts. Um, I usually do both just so that we're doing various stimuli right? Because mm -hmm. some kids are, are tactile learners. Some of them are kinesthetic. Mm -hmm. Others are oral. And so they, they don't necessarily need to feel it, but they do need to hear it. So we do it both ways. Um, we'll clap the rhythm together as a team. Um, and then I will usually draw a big circle around it and put the slash through and say, okay, now it's poison. So if you hear it, don't clap it. Don't do anything. Okay. Just stand there. And then I clap, uh, clap a series of rhythms myself that they are then to repeat. So it's call and response really. And then if mm -hmm. I call, if I clap the poison rhythm and they clap it back to me, those students are out. Oh, I and love it. So it's not just, um, not thinking and repeating it's actual intentional thinking and analysis. Correct. Correct. That's so much fun. And so, yeah, games like that, um, those are good transition games. Right. And I think is especially younger, uh, not younger, but necessarily beginning teachers. I know that that's what I struggled with. I struggled with transition between one concept to the next, that little middle time. It always made me nervous because that was the time that things could spontaneously combust. If I didn't have something waiting in the wings in my bag of tricks to go and do so that we could transition seamlessly. Transitions are so important. So we have Poison Echo. We have the heart game. I've played Poison Echo with Solfege. That's a lot of one of my favorite ways yes. to play it. That's they a good can't one to sing it. Or we have one interval they can't sing, but they have to sing all the other intervals, which is really right. fun working yeah. on audiation. So do you see a connection between your high school and junior high and your traditional work at church? Oh, thank you for asking. You know, um, yeah, because teaching is teaching. It doesn't matter the age, right? And it's just the concepts are the concepts are the concepts. And the only difference I have found is that it's how you deliver them, how you introduce them. So, you know, I, I am still teaching the same concepts to my adult church choir as I am at the high school, as I am at the junior high, and as I am in the Cincinnati Youth Choir. It's just how things are phrased how they are introduced, you know, because I wouldn't introduce the same way to a third grader or the same concept to a third grader that I would, you know, to someone that is a retiree, you know, mm -hmm. that has been singing as a volunteer church choir singer for decades. Um, but, but we still need that. We still need that review of, okay, so in this moment, we have to use this tenuto. And what is the why? What is the purpose of this tenuto? What well, I'm so I glad you connected it to the why, because that that ties back to what you were just saying. Those kids aren't going to sing for you if they don't, they don't know why you're there supporting them. So let's think of an example. So we've been talking about crescendos and decrescendos and legatos and staccatos. So can you give us an example of a time that that's appeared in all three of your teaching realms and how you would introduce it differently? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, for the youngest kids, again, 
we make a game out of it. We make them speak it. We make them hear it. We make them feel it um, again. And it's just varying your stimulus, right? Mm-hmm. So that I might teach the same concept three, four, five different ways, because there are three, four, five different types of kids and different types of learners in my rehearsal setting, right? Mm-hmm. Same thing um, at the junior and high school, or excuse me, junior high and high school. Um, I might teach it a few different ways to kind of grab those different types of learners. Um, it might not be necessarily always game-based at the high school, um, but I might have them like, let's take the idea of a two noodle, right? A stretch, just a little mm-hmm. stretch. Um, I might have them sing it initially just to kind of gauge where they're at with the concept um, through a phrase of their own choral literature. Um, Then we might talk a little bit about what it is. And then we might try to sing it a different way. And I might have them physically stretch their hands apart, Mm -hmm. right, to feel that. Or um, I might make them walk the rehearsal room in a way that shows me what a tunudo is. How can you move your legs? How can you move your feet in a stretched out manner as you're singing? So we might do it just walking, then we might do it walking and singing the phrase. But again, it's always putting it into your body. I'm very big in like using our body to express what the music is is trying to show us. Um, And I find that once it's in the body, it's in the voice. Right. And I've actually done that with my, my, God bless them, my church choir folks. That's what I was about to say. How did you get your church choir up out of their seats moving around? Same thing. Oh, gosh, I have pulled them out of our choir room and made them stand in a circle and hold like push against each other's hands to show the push of a crescendo, the movement of a crescendo. Um, We've done push pull, you know, they God, God bless them. They truly um, are so wonderful and flexible because we throw a lot of weird at them. Mm -hmm. But isn't that like the point is to see what actually sticks? I I think teaching this is such a great example of just throw out what you need them to know as long as you know the concept you want them to teach and how you want it to sound. That goes back to the beginning, the art of making music. It really is. It's an art form. And, you know, my volunteer choir singers at, you know, Epiphany United Methodist Church are just as much of artists as my, you know, third, fourth, fifth graders, Um, even though maybe they didn't like their musical experience is truly, they have sung in a church choir, but maybe they're the CEO of a company. It doesn't mean that they're not artists, Mm -hmm. right? Oh, I love it. Giving the artist approach, looking through an artist lens. What are you most excited to teach this week? Mm, Well, I'm really looking forward. I've um, I've been in quarantine (laughs) because I got COVID. So I'm really looking forward to getting back um, with these folks and just hearing group music again. And I know it sounds like such a basic concept, but when you haven't heard it, I mm-hmm. really miss it. So I'm looking forward to focusing on tone quality and learning different ways to, um, you know, access the different elements of their music. I'm, so when, just, you, when you say tone quality, what are you, what are you thinking about? What are you approaching? I know that's like a big, sure. we say vowels and what do our vowel shapes look like and how are we singing through our mechanism to make the best sound as a whole? Right. Um, so again, um, you know, I was really lucky in college. I worked with a voice teacher that was really, obviously all voice teachers are really big into the physiology of making sound and making it healthfully. And that's my, my number one thing is creating a tone that is healthful. Um, that's, you know, full, that's using all of these wonderful parts of our body that we've been given. Right. So Mm -hmm. breathing deeply, filling up that air column within the, the, structure of our bodies, um, singing on the breath column, um, keeping your soft palate nice and lifted, uh, breathing in. We talk a lot. Um, I even do this with my adults, breathing, breathing in like you're yawning so that it lifts the soft palate up in the back of the throat. Like we all do, you know, but if you're not brought up with that, you know, you're hearing Mm -hmm. it maybe for the first time, you know, having to explain that why all over again. And yeah, explaining the why. So like, you know, when we sing with a nice, tall, rounded vowel sound, with lots of space in the back of the throat, using the rib cage, the intercostal muscles, the diaphragm, it can create a situation. And my church choir is small, like many church choirs. It's small. There's about 15 folks. But when they sing using those concepts and they really access those different concepts and are able to put them into their mind's eye and then into the body, we sound like a choir of 30. You know, and that's kind of a fun thing to experience, I think. I think I have designed the Sandy Thornton list of things. One, what is the concept I want them to get? 
How are we going to get there with our eyes, our ears, and our body? How are we going to do so healthily and as a team? So it's not just from the top down. You're letting them get involved. And then I feel like there's a big fun factor in all things that you're – like everything you're saying, you have a huge smile on your face. So that I'm calling those this, the four steps to the Sandy Thornton method. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And I love um, – you know, it, you were talking a little bit about just we are a team. And I think that's that's the biggest thing that I try to hit home with singers of all ages that when I first started teaching, it was very much a me-centric operation. I'm going to just be completely transparent because I didn't know any other way, right? Mm -hmm. And so it was always, okay, what do I have to accomplish? What are these things that I've got to get across so that they can be successful? But really, true choral artistry is absolutely teamwork, don't you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do they need? How can I help them find How can it? we do this together? It's not mm -hmm. just me. Like we're all working. We're mm -hmm. all moving to the next level together. I love it. Oh, Sandy, I'm so thankful you had time in your crazy schedule of all these different spectrums that you are making music in to sit down and share a little spotlight of teacher life. Is there anything you really want the listener to walk away from this episode with? And yes, I think that no matter who you're making music with, no matter what their level of experiences or their age or, you know, any of that, just remember, you know, what we are doing, what we have been given is truly a gift, truly. And, and go and enjoy your singers. Mm. I can't wait. I'm so excited for rehearsal. I mean, I was already excited for rehearsal, but like now I'm really excited. Thank you so much, Sandy. This has been a fun, fast conversation. Thank you again. Thank you so much. It's been a gift to be here with you. And just um, thank you to your listeners for today. And uh, yeah, this was so much fun. The Sandy Thornton method includes <laughs> what is the content you want them to know? How can you get there as a team? What is something fun you can do? And how can the whole experience be memorable? I think that's about it. I hope that this has given you a little bit of fire and spark to get you through the rest of this fall season with whatever that means for you and your ensembles and your teaching spaces. Sandy, it was such a fun time talking to her, and I seriously can't wait to stop editing and go prepare for rehearsal tonight. I have a couple fun games I want to toss in now. Above all else, I hope you know that you, you matter. We all know that music matters, especially rehearsal games. And I'll see you next time on the Music Ed Matters podcast. <laughs>